Now that we've seen how waves can interfere with each other in constructive and destructive manner, let's see some of the more interesting effects of that interference. So I have created here some sort of barrier uh, upon which I'm going to let some waves be incident. So I've got some sort of medium of propagation on this side of the barrier, uh, and then the same medium of propagation. So this is not a boundary between media, although the barrier is certainly a different medium than around here. But we're going to assume that the waves that are incident upon this barrier uh, cannot transmit through the barrier. That is, they're all going to reflect from the barrier. But I have put into this barrier two slits. And I've had to make the slits very large, of course, to, so you can see them. But the, the understanding here is that the slits, the width of the slits, make sure you can see that, is on the same order as the wavelength. That is, these things are not really super small compared with the wavelength. If that happens, uh, the waves bounce off of these slits like they're not even there. They're also not super large with respect to the wavelength, although they can be somewhat large. They can be a little bit larger than the wavelength or a little bit smaller, that's fine. But they're on the same order. They're about the same size. So what will happen is as waves come into the barrier here, they're gonna reflect off the solid portions, but they're actually gonna be able to get through the, uh, the portions where I have cut a hole. So let me draw some incident waves. Now what I'm drawing here are what are usually called the wave fronts. You can think of these lines as, if there are a bunch of waves incident upon this barrier, maybe I draw a line through all the peaks, or maybe I draw a line through all the troughs, or through all the zero points. Some sort of uh, indication that all these, all these waves are coming through with, uh, at, in the same phase, right? They're lined up, they're coherent. So let's just assume that I've drawn a line through all the peaks, all the, all the, uh, the high points of the wave. Okay, fair enough. Up here, like I said, they're gonna hit the barrier and they're gonna bounce off. I'm gonna get reflection. Same down here, same here. Although, I'm going to allow the waves that come through the slits to propagate onto the other side. Now, one thing I forgot to, to mention, there is a characteristic distance here. The distance between the slits, I'm gonna call D. So these slits are a width D apart. Okay, what happens to these waves as they pass through the slits? We, we know that they reflect into, into the, back into the, the first region from the barrier, but what happens to the ones that pass through the slits? Well, if the slits are narrow enough, they start to act like point sources. Think of the last time you dropped a rock or a pebble into a lake or a pond. What happened? That acts like a point source and waves ripple out from there. So that's actually what we find on the other side here. We find that the waves have diffracted. Diffracted is another word for bending. We saw refraction when uh, rays bent as they move into a new medium. There's not a new medium here, right? This is the same medium as it is over here, as it is in the slit. So there's no refraction, but we, what we do find is that the waves will bend around the obstacles and we call that diffraction. So my drawing is probably gonna get a little convoluted. That's okay, give me one more. So you see what's happening. I now have, in essence, two point sources of waves that are sending waves out into this region. Well, what happens when two waves of the same kind propagate through the same region at the same time? They interfere with each other. That's right. So you will have regions of constructive interference. And if I've said if I've said that these lines are the crests of the wave, notice that every time those lines line up, I'm going to get constructive interference. Halfway between the lines would be the troughs of the wave. And so every time I have the troughs of the wave line up, which would be right in the center of these four-sided figures, I'm going to get constructive interference. And then between those two points, I'm gonna get destructive interference because I'll find a point where the, the crests and the troughs line up of the different waves. And so I'm gonna get constructive and destructive, all uh, the whole spectrum. I'm gonna get total constructive, total destructive, and everything in between in different regions here. 
All right, what can we do with this? Well, let's imagine that these are water waves. They don't have to be water waves, certainly, but it's easy to visualize. So let's, let's imagine that these are water waves and that we're looking at it from above. And that over here, I have put, let me do a different color, I've put some sort of other barrier, maybe a concrete wall. What's going to happen? Well, these waves are going to come in and they're going to lap up against the concrete wall. We've seen this happen, most of us in real life. Well, at the points where I get constructive interference, the waves are just going to lap higher. That's what constructive interference does. It makes the amplitudes larger. There will be points where I get destructive interference and the waves won't lap at all at that point. So if I were to, to shift my perspective and look at the wall from, uh, from this direction, so here's my wall, what would I find? If I looked at the watermarks, and let me do this with a different color. If I look at the watermarks on the wall, on this wall that these, all these waves are incident uh, upon, I will find that there are regions where I get high watermarks, regions where I get low watermarks, high, low, and so on and so forth. And I, I did mean to make this one bigger than these. It, it, I imagine that the wall continues on, right? I, I've just given you a section of it. Uh, but I will find watermarks where I get constructive interference, destructive inter I should say complete constructive interference, complete destructive interference, and then everything in between, right? High watermarks, low watermarks, and then everything in between because I have regions where I get mixtures, right? Some, it's some, some regions are more constructive than others. Some regions are completely constructive. Some we, regions are, um, are completely destructive. So that's what I would get. So I get what's called an interference pattern over here. If I were to draw this on this from above, just to remind you what it would look like, I would get something like this. where I've tried to draw that high one right in the center. I don't know that I've succeeded, but the idea is here, I get this constructive interference that looks like this. I get an interference pattern. The only way I can get an interference pattern is if I have waves. Waves are what interfere with each other. So if you have a system of like set up like this and you get an interference pattern over here, this happens because of diffraction and superposition. Those are wave properties, so I have to, what this tells you is you absolutely have a wave. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's imagine now that, well, I'm gonna keep it on this. Let's imagine that these are not water waves, that they're light waves, right? What would I get? Well, I wouldn't get watermarks. I would get something like a really bright spot where the waves are constructively interfering. Where they're destructively interfering with each other, I would get a really dark spot, right? Uh, some people use the word fringes. I would have a bright fringe and a dark fringe. And then in between, I would have, you know, something where the, the bright spot would fade to black, and then it would fade back up to bright, and then fade to black. And so I would get this interference pattern. It wouldn't look like watermarks, but it would look like bright and dark spots. Okay, can I characterize this? Well, that's what we do in this class, right? We characterize everything mathematically. So let me impose a coordinate system here. I'm going to uh, say, I'm gonna measure angles from this line. What do I mean? Well, there's an angle between this line and a line that connects uh, this point to this bright spot and this bright spot and this dark spot. As I've drawn it, this should be an angle of zero degrees for this bright spot. This would be our central bright spot. So I can, of course, draw an angle theta like that, which connects this point to that bright spot. So that's the geometry of what I'm going to do. And of course, there's a different theta for this. There, If I'm measuring from this line, there would be a negative theta for this, a negative theta for this. We typically ignore all the negative regions. It turns out this is symmetrical. It's a mirror image basically, so if you can characterize the ones up here, you can characterize the ones down here. I'm going to show you how to do it, but we typically don't worry about this region. We typically just worry about this one. All right, so can I make some sort of mathematical um, expression out of all this? And the answer is yeah, but I've got to make a few approximations. So the first thing I would say is recall, I've, I've kind of covered it over, 
that the distance between the slits is D. Now, what I'm gonna make, I'm gonna move this paper, I'm gonna make the assumption that the distance between the barrier, well, this for the barrier, sorry, the distance between the barrier and the detector, I should say. So here's my barrier with the slits, and here's my detector. And I'm going to let this be some distance L. And I'm going to make the assumption that L is much, much greater than D. Where D, remember, is, is this, I'll draw it on this side, is this distance here. So the distance between the slits is D. Uh, I'm going to assume that it's much greater distance to the detector. If you can see everything that I've drawn here, kind of, sort of. <laughs> uh, much greater distance to the detector than the slit width, or the distance between the slits D. If I can make that assumption, notice what I can do. Let, let me pick out one of those bright spots. Let's say I pick out this one. So there, I know that there's one here, and that's, I've drawn my coordinate axis to that one. Let me make sure you can see this. I've drawn my coordinate axis to that one. And let me pick out, let's say the first bright spot that I find after the central. And let's see what I can do here. Well, the reason this is a bright spot is because, or the reason I get interference at all, is because the light that's reaching this from these two slits takes a different path. Remember, interference happens when you have light taking different path links to a, to a common point. So the first one is going to take this angle or th this path, I should say. The second one is gonna take this path. Now, as I've drawn that, I hope it's obvious that these path links are different, and I hope it's obvious that they form a triangle. And I hope it's still obvious that this side of the triangle is, which you can't see on the screen, because I'm trying to get everything in, is a distance D. All right, All right now, that's the geometry. But, as I've drawn it, this assumption is wrong. L is not much, much greater than D. It's greater than D, but it's not much, much greater than D. But let's imagine what it was, this would look like if it, if it were. That would mean that this angle is really tiny. I have a really, really, really acute triangle here. This is a very small angle. What that means is that these lines, which are definitely not parallel because this is a triangle, but if this angle is really small, these lines are almost, almost parallel. In fact, they're so close to being parallel that I can make an approximation that they're parallel. Are they really? No. If they were parallel, we'd never form a triangle. That's not how triangles work. But if I can approximate these two as parallel, I get an interesting situation. So let me take this little section and zoom in. Here's my barrier. Here's path one. Here's path two. Notice I've drawn them parallel. Okay, fair enough. Well, if these guys are getting to the same point somewhere over here, what is the difference in path length? Well, it's got to be the distance. Oh, I, I should say, if I draw the triangle here, it's the distance, the difference in path length that these two guys take from their sources to the observation point has got to be that distance right there. Okay. As it turns out, we can do the geometry here. This, let me do it in pen so you can you know, convolute everything, is the angle theta. What is theta? Theta is the angle that I'm making from this point to my bright spot. You can run through the geometry if you want to. Turns out we've made a similar triangle. This is really similar to what we did when we did inclined plane problems in physics one. I've made a similar triangle and this is theta. Remember that this side is D, uh, which turns out to be the hypotenuse of this right triangle that I've constructed. So it turns out that the path length difference to a good approximation is D 
sine of theta. This side is d sine theta. This is the hypotenuse. This is theta. This is d sine theta. That is the sorry. That is the path length difference between these two rays that enable them to interfere with each other. Fair enough. Well, we know how to handle some path length differences, uh, and now we know how to characterize this path length difference. What does that mean? Well, we saw in the last video that if the path length difference between these two waves is a half integer multiple of the wavelength, then I get destructive interference. Remember, if I take a wave and then I take another wave, but then in this, how I've drawn it, I get constructive interference. But if I take this wave and I shift it over by half of a wavelength, I will get destructive interference. I have constructive here, shift this by half a wavelength, I get destructive interference. So if my path length difference is a half integer multiple, right? Lambda over two, three lambda over two, five lambda over two, I get destructive interference. If it's a whole integer multiple, either zero, or if I shift the whole wave over by a whole wavelength, I get the exact same situation. So integer multiples get me constructive interference. Half integer multiples get me destructive interference. What is my path length difference? D sine theta. If I find that the path length difference is equal to a whole integer multiple of the wavelength for m, I'll write it like this, an element of the set of integers. You might prefer to write it like this, zero plus or minus one, plus or minus two, et cetera, et cetera. If that's the case, then I get constructive interference. This is, I'll write it up here. I'm out of room, aren't I? It's okay. Um, now we know what m is. m is an element of the set of integers. Let me write this down here again so that I can get everything in the frame. d sine theta is equal to m lambda for m, a set of the integers, positive and negative. This yields constructive interference. That's where I get bright spots. If the path length difference, d sine theta, is equal to a half integer multiple, which I will write like this, m plus one half lambda. I'm going to get out of that destructive interference. All right. Notice if m is equal to zero, I get lambda over two. If m is equal to one, I get three lambda over two. If m is equal to two, I get uh, five lambda over two. So this works to characterize this system. m, and remember what d is, d is the distance between the slits. m is called the order. And you will find different textbooks that do this different ways. Uh, you'll find different teachers that do it different ways. The way I do it is I let uh, the central bright spot. I call that the zeroth order. It doesn't matter what you call it. This corresponds to m equal to zero, right? If m is equal to zero, then... And this is a bright spot, so I have constructive interference. Is m, if m is equal to zero, the right-hand side is zero. The only way to get zero out of this is to let theta be zero. That is what I get for that central bright spot. I call this the zeroth order. Some people call it the first order. I think it's a little confusing. I call it the zeroth order. Maybe zeroth is not any less confusing, but still. Uh, but m is equal to zero is, we would say, zeroth. That means m is equal to one, we'd say first order. I like that because if you're asked to find something like the third order maximum, you or which is another way of saying third order order bright spot, third order bright fringe, third order bright spot, third order maximum, all those words mean the same thing. Uh, if you're asked to find that, you just know that m is equal to three in that case. Uh, if you call this the first order, you've got to subtract one. I, I like this, but you, you know, if you're in my class, this is what we'll do. If you're in somebody else's class, do whatever your teacher has told you to do. What matters is that you're consistent. Okay, so that M is the order. 
I get constructive or destructive interference, and I get the angle at which I find those. Remember that angle looks like this. This is the angle at which I find, in this case, this would be the zero first second order maximum. This would be the first order maximum. This would be the zero order maximum. That language does get confusing when we're talking about minima, though. So if I'm looking at the minimum here, let me draw that angle. If I'm looking at this first minimum, when I say first, you might think, aha, m has got to be equal to 1. But notice, this is one half of a wavelength shift, right? If I shift it by half a wavelength, I get this minimum. If I shift it by 3 lambda over 2, I get this one. This next one would be 5 lambda over 2, but this one's just lambda over 2. To get that from this expression, what do I need to let m be? Well, m is equal to 0. If I let m is equal to 0, I get lambda over 2. So it does get a little bit confusing. So what you got to remember is that for this, m is equal to 0. For this first minimum, m is also equal to 0. For this minimum, m is equal to 0. But then for this maximum, we get m equal to 1, which means for this minimum, m is also equal to 1. For this maximum, m is equal to 2, and so on and so forth. Now, down here on the other side, this maximum doesn't correspond to m is equal to 1. This is m is equal to negative 1, m equal to negative 1 m equal to negative 2, so on and so forth. Like I said, we typically don't worry about these. The negative sign just introduces a negative to your angle, uh, so you have a, a, an angle below the horizontal. If you can characterize the upper part of this, you can characterize the lower part of it. No big deal. We don't even usually, af after this, I'm not even going to talk about the lower part. Uh, I just worry about the upper part. So we, we typically ignore the, negatives, uh, the negative aspect here and just focus on the positive. <laughs> focus on the positive, right? Good life advice. Uh, so this is how you handle this double slit diffraction. If you Google the Young's double slit experiment, you'll find lots of cool pictures of actual uh, diffraction occurring and in interference, I should say, an interference pattern occurring. Uh, but hopefully this makes some sense. If we know what D is, we know what sine theta is, we know what M is, we know what uh, the wavelength is, we can do a lot of things uh, with this with this system.